Well, tonight was Super Tuesday 3, and the results are not good. It was a clean sweep for Joe Biden. Three states voted, Florida, Arizona, and Illinois, and Joe Biden won all three handily. In the state of Florida, with 98% of precincts reporting, Joe Biden won with 61, almost 62% of the vote overall, and Bernie Sanders got just under 23%. When it comes to Illinois, Joe Biden won with 59% of the vote. Bernie got 36%. And in the state of Arizona, it was called almost immediately for Joe Biden once the polls closed. He is with 56% of precincts reporting at the time I record this video, winning with 42.6% to Bernie's 30.2%. By the time you see this, we'll likely have 90 to 100% of precincts reporting, but I don't really expect Joe Biden's lead to shrink. Now, going into Super Tuesday 3, there were a couple of things that we were looking at with hopes that that would maybe shift the dynamic of this race because this has been an incredibly volatile primary process. The first failed. So that was the Democratic debate on Sunday. You know, Joe Biden was able to keep it together long enough for two hours to at least seem as if He's not in complete cognitive decline, even though he showed that at previous debates, but he held his own. And um, I don't think Bernie was aggressive enough. I think that at the end of the day, it wasn't enough to move the needle. So the second thing that could have possibly changed the dynamics of this race was the global pandemic that we're all facing. At every single state so far where the vote took place, exit polls showed that people support Medicare for all, regardless if they were voting for Joe Biden or Bernie Sanders. So you'd think that, you know, given how important healthcare is, especially now, people would maybe wake up and opt for Bernie Sanders and not vote against their own self-interest. That wasn't the case. They still voted for Joe Biden. And before I start to talk about what we need to start thinking about going forward, I do want to get to some additional numbers because once again, Medicare for all was a winner. In Illinois, 59% of voters supported. In Florida, 55% of voters supported. In Arizona, 58% of voters supported. So, so far in every single state, Medicare for All is winning by large margins, but yet people are still voting for the candidate who is openly hostile towards it and said he would veto it. So it's completely nonsensical, and people are now knowingly voting against their own self-interest, but they're clearly making this decision out of what they believe to be necessity. They think Joe Biden can beat Donald Trump. That's why they're opting for him over Bernie Sanders. Now, one poll that I found absolutely nonsensical is this exit poll from Florida, where it shows that when it comes to who voters trust to handle Social Security, Joe Biden is winning this with 59%. So it really doesn't matter that there are numerous videotapes of Joe Biden saying he wants to cut Social Security. Voters in Florida still think he's the best to handle Social Security. Incredible. Now, one thing that I find interesting is that Bernie Sanders over the last month has been beaten over the head with this, uh, you know, this attack because he apparently praised Cuban dictator Fidel Castro, even though he just praised their education and healthcare system. And they claimed that this would hurt him among Cuban Americans, but he actually won over Cuban Americans by a percentage point over Joe Biden. And I just found that kind of funny. So what's happening now is the same thing basically that happened in 2004. You had a Democratic Party base that was so anxious, so terrified at the prospect of the Republican incumbent being reelected that they just voted for the first person who seemed to have momentum. And Bernie had the momentum at first. But, you know, having Obama pull the strings behind the scenes to get everyone else to drop out and endorse Joe Biden... That really made a substantial uh, difference. You know, uh, everyone, the voters who were backing Pete Buttigieg, Amy Klobuchar, and also Elizabeth Warren, seemed to opt for Joe Biden over Bernie Sanders. And um, here we are. Now, as the results come in, uh, dropout Bernie is trending on Twitter. So it's funny because all of these people are very giddy. They're kind of dancing on Bernie Sanders' political grave, so to speak. But have fun beating Donald Trump without Bernie Sanders supporters because now is the time for unity, as you all like to say. And you're getting what you wanted. You're winning. So what you have to do now is try to convince people who are not going to be voting for Joe Biden, who are going to stay home, to get on your team. And gloating like this is not a good idea. You should be reaching out saying, look, we'll work towards Medicare for all in the future, doing anything, right? Because 
you saw what happened when you ran a centrist back in 2016. A centrist lost to Donald Trump. Now, the economy is crashing. The stock market is falling. We're facing a global pandemic. So um, if that doesn't change, Donald Trump could very well be defeated by Joe Biden. And I want to think through the consequences of that and what we should do as a left movement going forward. But I don't just want to be 100% down. There are two pieces of really good news. The first is that Marie Newman defeated Dan Lipinski in Illinois. She ran before, but she lost. And now she beat him. He is an anti-choice, anti-gay, conservative Democrat that the establishment supported over her, who's a justice Democrat, and she just beat him. That is phenomenal news. I don't know how good of a progressive she's going to be. Maybe she'll be an AOC. Maybe she'll be an Ayanna Presley, a more Warren-type Democrat. Don't know, but I do know that that is a drastic improvement over basically a Republican in Dan Lipinski. Now, I don't know if Anthony Clark won his primary, so we're waiting on that. But overall, let's kind of talk through the implications of this and what the left should do going forward. There's a lot of people talking about leaving the Democratic Party, and I intend to do that. I had to re-register as a Democrat in 2019 after Dem exiting in 2016 because I live in a closed primary state, so I can't vote for Bernie Sanders in Oregon if I don't register as a Democrat. However, after I cast my vote for Bernie, I will promptly re-register as an independent because I don't identify with the Democratic Party. So there are people talking about Dem exit. There are people talking about Biden possibly picking a progressive VP to woo Bernie Sanders supporters. I don't think he's going to do that because it's Joe Biden. Um, so I feel like that's almost out of the question. We have people floating the idea of creating a third party. And I, I think that that's something that we always should have had on the table. I was in support of the draft Bernie movement back in 2017 and 2018, I believe, um, created by Nick Branham. Um, but with that being said, I want people to think pragmatically, for lack of a better word, about having a third party, because if you're going to have a third party, you don't want it to just eat away votes from the Democratic Party. I mean, certainly that's important for having leverage, but I want a third party that can win. And I don't just want like a third party. I want five to six parties. I think that's a pretty good number to really represent the range of ideologies in the United States. And the way that you do that is very simply, you call on your representatives to support H.R. 4000, which um, changes us from winner-take-all to proportional representation. It increases the district magnitude from one to two or three, which means rather than us just having one representative, we have two to three, which means that the results will be more proportional. Because if you have, you know, um, two people going um, up against each other, a corporate Democrat and a progressive, for example, maybe they both get elected to Congress. So that increases automatically the number of progressives in Congress. That's important. On top of that, it institutes nationwide ranked choice voting. That's something that absolutely is crucial if we want a viable third party. And we do. We want Green Party members in Congress. We want socialists in Congress, right? And in Maine, you see a very competitive race with, you know, a progressive Democrat, there's a corporate Democrat, but also a Green Party member. So ranked choice voting would do wonders. And even if it doesn't get passed through legislation like H.R. 4000, ranked choice voting is something that at the state level, you can try to get on the ballot, right? Have a vote on it, a statewide referendum, if that's available in your state as an option. It's tough. You have to collect signatures, put in the work. But it is something that I think is warranted. Uh, but certainly don't do that during self-quarantine, of course. Um, but the thing about having... A third party or a fourth party is that it may solve some of our issues but i want people to really think broader because our system is a very very ruthless and vicious capitalist system so we might be temporarily satisfied with a viable third party alternative but capitalism is like a virus so it eventually will destroy that third party and make it a corporate party as well so you really have to be fighting to, you know, reduce the influence of capitalism as much as you possibly can. And that's so hard to achieve when we don't have political power. So, like, we we have to focus on electoral politics. But really, I think that the thing that gives me hope is not just this hyper-focus on electoral politics, not the prospect of a third party and attacking capitalism head-on and trying to teach people about how capitalism is impacting their lives in a very negative way. I think that 
we need to really harness the power of grassroots organizing. And I think that that's really the only way that we can influence electoral politics until we get power. Because we can't just keep waiting every four or two years to have elections and then we do nothing. We need to have action that is taken immediately because we don't have much time left to act on climate change. Thousands of people die every single year because they don't have health care. So I want to see like a nationwide mobilized effort like Occupy, like we can't just wait for elections. We have to demand now, regardless of who's president, regardless of the makeup of Congress, action. We need a really simple message. You know, a student debt cancellation, Medicare for all, a Green New Deal, something that is going to be clear, concise, and communicated to people. It's based off of popular policy positions. The thing about Occupy is that it was difficult to get it to last because there was no leadership and movements need leaders. That's, I think, you know, an unfortunate fact of reality. But on top of that, the media, it smeared Occupy because it claimed that it didn't have any underlying goals. So we need to be clear and have underlying goals, but we do have to expect the media to be equally hostile to whatever movement emerges out of this, if that is in fact something that happens. But we have to take on the media as well, protest the media. Like, you've got to understand that at every single town hall, we should be occupying these town halls, protesting these town halls, demanding Medicare for all. If we need to, we should have a general strike to get the policies that we need to help working class Americans. Like, we don't have time to wait for, you know, the next four to eight years to try to get someone who's progressive that may lose in a Democratic primary or maybe a fake progressive like Barack Obama. We don't have time to try to build up some type of new organization. Like, we need action right now. It can't wait. So that's why I think all this grassroots power that was, you know, that manifested in 2016 and I think reemerged or at least came back together in 2019 and 2020, that needs to be harnessed in a new way to just put constant pressure on both Democrats and Republicans and never stop organizing, getting people out to vote. Um, you know, these are just things that I'm kind of throwing out there, right? But I, I think that one thing that's clear is regardless of what happens, you know, um, you shouldn't give up. You shouldn't give up. And trust me, I know how easy it is to want to give up. There are times where I feel like I don't want to get out of bed in the morning. It's difficult to not be blackpilled, you know, because the system just beats you down and it just feels like every single thing we do is hopeless. Like trying to spread the word about Joe Biden's record on Social Security. And Floridians think that he's better to deal with Social Security. So it's just, it's it's so frustrating. And I feel your pain. I, I feel you. I live it with you, right? I, I get it. And on top of that, I'm dealing with my own issues currently, you know, um, besides this election. We're all dealing with COVID-19 so I get how easy it is and how desirable it seems to just check out of politics, but you have to keep fighting. And I don't necessarily know how to fight going forward, to be honest. I don't know what that entails. I think some type of organization would really be important, some type of movement, you know, a wide, massive movement that is a rainbow coalition, you know, that is of all working class people of all colors and, you know, origins. I think that's important. I don't know how we get there. I don't know who organizes it. There's a lot of things that we have to do. But on top of that, I also think that this is a time of introspection. I think that we have to try to figure out what we did wrong um, in this election cycle. Maybe the amount of things that we can control. Because, again, there's, there's you know, things that are out of our control. You know, the media is always going to hate us. So that's something that we can't control. Maybe we need a better media strategy, though. But the things that we could control, what could we do better? Did Bernie Sanders' campaign do enough to reach out to older black voters? That's where he was lacking. Um, that This was something that his campaign needed to address back in 2016. I don't think that in 2016 he did enough. And in 2020, clearly he didn't do enough um, because he didn't win them over. So there's a lot of things that we have to um, think about. What did we do right? What we, did we do wrong? Because I don't think we're perfect. You're, you're never going to run a perfect campaign. We're never going to be a perfect movement. So it's not, it's not going to be, you know, helpful for us to just say, well, you know, we just, we got beat by the establishment. That's true. Um, but we also have to try to figure out what we could do differently. And I don't want you to base it off of like, you know, what the mainstream media says. Oh, we were too aggressive. Bernie bros. That's not like, 
we have to be realistic about what actually we could control. It, no matter what, we would be labeled Bernie bros. I think that's out of our control. No matter what, um, the media is going to paint Bernie Sanders' movement as disproportionately white, straight males. So there are things that we have to do better uh, in the future. And I don't know when the next progressive champion is going to come along. You know, the problem, and I heard Jamie of uh, uh, Majority Report and the Michael Brooks show made this fantastic point that left-wing movements around the world they have an issue with succession like they have leaders but these leaders oftentimes are older and there's nobody else really that can take their place like after bernie who's the next progressive champion aoc is very young i don't think she's gonna want to run i don't know that she, you know, is going to be able to do what Bernie Sanders did. You know, she has to work on foreign policy. Um, so who's next? Is it Elizabeth Warren? Hell no. She is a clown. She revealed herself. So we have to think about succession. We have to think about our next steps going forward. But one thing that I just want to stress overall is that you stay engaged in the process and you don't check out of politics as difficult um, as it may seem. Um if you check out, then um, all hope is gone. And so long as there are people willing to fight, then I think that there's something to be hopeful for. There's something to be hopeful for. Because we have made some huge gains. I mean, it sucks that we're not getting a nominee who supports Medicare for All, but the fact that we convinced everyone in four years to support Medicare for All, that really is important you know, because it shows that we have been effective at messaging. So we just have to figure out what to do differently. And I'm not, um, I'm not suggesting that Bernie should drop out. I have a separate video coming tomorrow where I talk about why he shouldn't drop out because he has to stay in the race for very specific reasons. He has leverage and political capital and he needs to spend that wisely. But I just think that, you know, it's very obvious. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Bernie can't, really win at this point unless something giant happens that is completely unforeseen we're on a trajectory to where joe biden is uh, basically going to be the nominee and the democratic voting base just wants to coronate someone who can beat donald trump in their view can he beat donald trump generally speaking no but if there's like a huge uh recession not good for the sitting president so joe biden might just have the luckiest timing ever right? Where you're running against an incumbent and a demoralized and fearful democratic base. And there's this huge crash. Now the, the scary part, um, with the economy, by the way, now the scary part about this is that, um, Joe Biden is not fit to deal with this economic downturn. He's not fit to deal with a global pandemic. Is he better than Donald Trump? Yes. And certainly if he's the nominee, um, I'll be rooting against Donald Trump, but I won't be rooting for Joe Biden. I hope he beats Donald Trump. But I mean, if he beats Donald Trump, we may be better off for four years. But long term, we're not going to be better off, right? Um, he takes control of the Democratic Party apparatus. You know, once again, centrists are in control. And it doesn't matter if he um, is the nominee and then loses to Donald Trump. Centrists will still say a centrist is the most electable. The media will still push that. So, you know, I don't know what we do as a movement going forward. But the one thing that I do want people to take away is that you can't give up. As long as you're still willing to fight in some way, no matter what that way is, maybe we don't know yet, maybe it's not clear right away, but so long as you are committed to fight, then there is still hope. But once we we say we're not going to fight, once we say we're giving up, once we say we're all black-pilled, then the hope diminishes. So... I'll leave you with that because this is this this sucks and I think that you should take some time to, you know, give yourself a little bit of a break. Animal Crossing's coming out on Friday. Play that. Just, you know, um distract yourself if you need to because we have so much on our plates. The deck is stacked against us. And I get how easy it is to be demoralized and part of me wants to give up. A big part of me wants to give up, but I know in the back of my mind that that's something that I can't do. We don't have a choice. We don't have a choice. We have to continue to fight for what's right in whatever capacity going forward that gets us change. And maybe we keep losing, but as long as we keep fighting, 
then that's just that's something that holds us all together and makes us stronger. Um, so, look, it sucks. I get it. It absolutely is depressing. I know that a lot of you are feeling this, but you're not alone. We're all experiencing the disappointment together. We're all feeling incredibly demoralized. I mean, I'm grieving Bernie Sanders' campaign and my dad at the same time. He just passed away two weeks ago as of today. So times are tough. You know, we can't leave our houses because of self-quarantine. It's so easy to give up right now. But just if there's any fight left in you at all, even just the tiniest bit, 0.01%, hang on to that. Hang on to that little fight. I don't care what it is, what, what, how, which way you want to fight, just hang on to it. Because that's the only thing that we have going for us going forward. And I'll leave that there. Just hang in there. That's all I can say.